Spills happen at a moment's notice, and the biggest challenge is, is one of getting people deployed very quickly. And in this case, we had people on scene within two hours telling us what kind of resources we need to deploy. I was the first OSC to show up on site. I expected to see a lot of oil when I got here, and, and I did. And actually, there was no water in the creek. When I showed up, it was oil. It was straight black crude oil, and it was rolling like a whitewater river, but in a creek. This is a major spill. There's a lot of oil out there. This is what we would call a type one event, very major release of contamination. EPA's primary role in this response is to direct the cleanup activities that Enbridge is responsible for performing. While there are a number of agencies with a high degree of interest in this incident and lots of participation, ultimately EPA is charged with making sure that the cleanup happens the way that it needs to. What you have with the Kalamazoo River system is a great resource for recreation. A lot of dollars come into our counties because people from all over the state of Michigan come to utilize this river and it's a huge benefit to our community. The minute people heard that the EPA was coming in to take care of this, it relieved people. You could see people's shoulders relax, so it's been a huge benefit. On July 27th, the state of Michigan posted swimming, boating, and fish consumption advisories from the release site downstream to Morrow Lake. Calhoun County also issued a voluntary evacuation of 61 homes near the spill site and a bottled water advisory for residents with private wells within 200 feet of the creek and river. Well, I think it's had a significant impact on all of the residents in the community and obviously this is the largest uh, contamination spill that we've dealt with as a state. There's been a lot of concern relative to air quality, groundwater quality, home values. So I think that to varying degrees everyone has had an impact as a result of the incident. In the area of the spill itself, the wildlife that we see being impacted is those that were directly touched by the oil. And so we're seeing a lot of turtles, mallards, Canada geese. Those are the primary sushi groups that have been impacted the most. This spill, because it happened during a high water event, had the opportunity to spread out across floodplains in critical wetland areas. We also see the effects on the vegetation and the plant life along the river that's been oiled and it's going to have to be removed. I think certainly the authority that the EPA brings to the incident is, is a major factor in getting the, the responsible party to respond properly. I think that's been the major factor in directing the work and making it a priority. It's EPA's responsibility to make certain that a responsible party like Enbridge has the right assets deployed. US EPA has deployed a number of our assets, including many OSCs, to not only work with Enbridge in the operations center, but also be the eyes and ears in the field overseeing the work that Enbridge and their contractors are doing along the river. Plus, we mobilized probably the biggest core of start responders, our Superfund technical assessment teams that we've done in our history in the region all at one time. They are responsible for air monitoring, they're responsible for environmental sampling, they're responsible for assisting EPA in, in conducting uh, uh, responsible party contractor oversight, uh, they're responsible for documentation, they're responsible for oversight of health and safety. Our start contractors now take on roles in the incident command system as well. To contain and reclaim the oil, 
responders utilized an arsenal of site-specific recovery and removal techniques. Near the release site and in some wetlands, excavators and crews physically removed affected vegetation and soil. Along the creek, river, and wetlands, containment booms directed oil to collection points where skimmers separated oil from the water. Vacuum trucks then pumped oil from the skimmers or directly from waterways. A variety of shaped absorbent booms were also utilized to soak up oil. At some remote locations, teams using low pressure, high volume hoses flushed oil from vegetation and shorelines for collection downstream. To free oil entrained in sediment for surface collection, teams employed mechanical aeration techniques. In areas with the heaviest concentrations of submerged oil, a hydraulic dredge removed, then pumped the contaminated sediment onshore for dewatering, treatment, and transportation. We have divided up the incident into two branches, one being east, one being west. The east branch includes A and B, which is the Talmadge Creek and the pipeline release. You know, there are a number of activities going on there, excavation, of contaminated soil, use of both skimmers, back trucks, and a lot of soil work. And then the west branch includes C, D, and E, which is the Kalamazoo River, uh, all the way to the Lake Moro. And there's a lot of contaminated vegetation in that area. There's a lot of boom deployed, more than 80,000 feet of boom, both containment and absorbent deployed out there. And the operation is broken down again into collection points that are monitored both by Enbridge and EPA. We kind of drew a line in the sand, or in this case the sediment, to make sure that oil did not impact Morrow Lake. EPA began doing multiple flyovers initially on Morrow Lake to make sure Sheen hadn't gotten down there. Uh, then um, we actually put some standing teams down at Morrow Lake to go on sheen patrol, if you will, to constantly look and collect sheen if it's not near our final containment structures just upstream of Morrow Lake. To help verify conditions at Morrow Lake, EPA utilized the Mud Puppy 2 research vessel to collect water and sediment samples. Managing an army of over 2,000 responders requires efficient structure. As part of the National Response Framework, EPA leads the National Incident Command System during an inland oil spill. The Unified Command is at the top of the organizational structure that was set up to manage the response. It consists of those local, state, and federal agencies with the most jurisdiction and resource deployment uh, on the incident. In this case, we have also elected to include Enbridge in the Unified Command since it has the most responsibility for deploying resources to respond to the incident. For Region 5, this is one of our first big incidents utilizing the Incident Command System. It's working very well. It's early in the incident, we did implement the planning process that started with having the Command and General Staff meetings, the Unified Command meetings, progressing around the planning cycle, and now we're really into a routine of uh, folks know what to expect with the daily meetings and establishing the objectives and m navigating that planning process. The cause of the spill is under investigation by EPA, the U.S. Department of Transportation Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, and the National Transportation Safety Board. The federal government intends to seek full reimbursement of cleanup costs from Enbridge. I think that the concerns that we'll still face is are, will the company actually carry through on what it's vowed to do? So far its track record is very good. We have no doubt that the EPA and the other agencies will carefully monitor and will step up to make requirements where it's necessary. We're pretty much determined we don't want to see oil flowing in that pipeline until we know what the problem is, that it's not epidemic in the rest of the line. I believe that between the NTSB and the EPA's investigations that that won't happen until we're sure that line is capable of flowing with zero incidents like this.
were at first very angry, and I think they were frightened about the implications of the spill, as, as you would expect. They wanted information, they wanted to know how they could help, and people have stepped forward and volunteered in all kinds of different ways. Hundreds of volunteers called to assist wildlife rehabilitation teams. Locals also organized a donation center for materials to help care for over 2,700 oiled birds and animals. Enbridge brought in a company called Focus Wildlife that have worked internationally on responding to oiled birds and spills. It's a basically state-of-the-art rehabilitation center with all the waste handling capability that you need to run a center like this. When birds are first brought to the Wildlife Response Center where the rehabilitation is going on, the first thing that has to happen is getting the birds medically stabilized. Once the birds are strong enough, and then they can start the wash process. It's a whole team of folks that work to wash each individual bird feather by feather in order to remove the oil so that when the birds are clean again, they can preen and restore the structure of the feathers. And then they go into another quiet area to recover from that process before they're moved into the conditioning pens where they have pools of water and perching areas and loafing areas and they're held there until they're ready for release. Binder Park Zoo and their veterinarians have been taking care of the turtles in the rehabilitation center. The turtles are washed once to get the, the gross contamination off of them but the crews have often ended up washing the same turtle two or three times in order to get into all the folds and areas. Um, where the turtles have gotten oiled. On September 17th, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration permitted Enbridge to gradually restart the repaired and tested pipeline. As of the fall of 2010, over 90,000 cubic yards of contaminated soil and debris were collected. Shorelines were cleaned, reconstructed, and revegetated. Over 13 million gallons of oil water mixture was disposed, and over 760,000 gallons of oil were recovered. Regional administrators typically don't get directly involved in spill response, but the administrator asked me specifically to come out here, and it has been great to see Region 5 and all of the other regions who have stepped forward to help uh, to see their performance. What we've demonstrated here is that when everyone keeps their eye on the ball and is focused on stopping the oil, it can go very, very well. The most important thing to us is to see that the river and the wetlands and the floodplains are restored to the condition they were in before this incident occurred. Long term, it's going to take more investigation by biologists and fisheries staff to evaluate whether there's any impact to the aquatic biota and ecosystem that's actually in the river. We would be lost without the EPA, and I'm proud to have them here and proud to work with them. So follow-up planning with that? The existing oil spill. It's not only the EPA, but the, our state partners as well. This is the collaboration that needs to happen to be able to address a, a situation like this, a situation as big as this. It's what we practice for all the time, but uh, it's nice to see it actually implement correctly. I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank the public from Calhoun and Kalamazoo County for their support of EPA and the other agencies during this cleanup. We wanted to absolutely make sure that this huge volume, massive volume of spilled oil did not even come close to threatening one of our Great Lakes. And as I go away from this incident, that will be something that I will feel most proud of, the fact that we made sure that the Great Lakes were not impacted.